it on my laptop screen Ready for the Python scene All those lines of text so clean Let's code and chase that dream Python world, here we go In this video, we're going to be talking about importing classes into another file. And this is great because it helps with reusability. Also, at the end of this video, we're going to be taking a look at an extra example of OOP and making classes in Python. This is a bit longer than we saw in the last video and a bit more involved. We're going to get started with how you import classes. And importing classes is very similar to what we've already seen with functions and other variables from another file. Recall that Python allows us to organize our code by placing classes as well as other code-like functions in separate files called modules. This is great because it allows us to keep our class definitions in separate files, which makes things more manageable and it promotes reusability. By reusability, we mean that you could use this in another project. If this class was really useful, you could then import that into a future project as well. Or if other people found that class useful, you could share it with them and they could also import it into their programs and use it in their own way. And the way we import something in Python is using the import statement. We've already seen some examples of this before when we're importing built-in modules, as well as modules that contained our own functions. Now we're going to use it to import classes. And it's a very similar syntax, and it uses the from and import keywords. So the syntax looks like this, from module name, where module name is also the name of the file that contains the class, except we don't include the file extension .py. Then we have the import keyword, and then the name of the class we're importing from that file. So if we're importing a class like bank account, we would say from the bank-account file, if it was called bankaccount.py, import bank account. So this allows us to import the class named class name from the module named module underscore name. The other way we can use this is by using an asterisk, that star character, instead of the class name. When we do this, it means import absolutely everything from the module. Any variables, any functions, any constants, any classes, they're all going to be imported from that module. This could be good or bad. It's good if you want absolutely everything imported, like if you have more than one class defined in it. But it can be bad because it will also import things you might not intend to import. So if you're going to use the asterisk character, be aware of what's in that module. Because if you import absolutely everything, it might start conflicting with your own names for variables, functions, and classes that you defined in the current file. Let's take a look at an example. And on the screen right now, I have two Python files. The first one's called mydogclass.py, and the second one is called main.py. Mydogclass defines a single class that represents a dog. Well, main.py uses that class. And before we get into how that works, we should talk a little bit about naming conventions here. So the name of the file is important. It's also the name of the module. So my underscore dog underscore class dot py, that file also defines a module called my underscore dog underscore class. And there are some rules about how we name modules in Python. And that is module names should be written in snake case. That's lowercase letters with the words separated by underscores. So other valid file names would be data underscore processing, user underscore authentication, and file underscore manager, all ending in .py. Now, another thing I should point out is unlike Java, where the file name has to match the class name, that's not the case in Python. You can have any number of classes defined in a Python module, and they don't have to match the name of the module. For example, here we have my underscore dog underscore class, that's the name of the module, and in that module, we have the definition of dog, the dog class. And those names don't match, and that's completely fine. So let's take a look at this example. In main.py, one of the first things we're doing is we are importing from the my dog class module. And what we're importing is the class dog. This is useful because it will allow us to make objects or instances of the dog class. So all of this class definition is imported by this line, and we can refer to it as dog with a capital D. And we just do just that on the next line where we make an instance of this class. And this instance is gonna be for a dog named buddy. So the attribute name is gonna be set to buddy by the int method here. Then when we call the line mydog.bark, it's going to output buddy says woof. Pretty straightforward, 
but this is an example of how we can import that dog class. And this would work for any class. If there's multiple classes in my dog class that we want to import all at once, we could use the asterisk character instead of a class name and import everything at once. Or we could just have multiple lines of from my dog class, import class name, and then we'd have one for each thing that we want to import. Either one is fine. So now for the rest of this video, we're going to take a look at an extra, more lengthy and complex example. If you're already good with OOP, you could probably skip this one. But if you'd like some more experience and see a more complex example, follow along with this. And here's the example we're going to be taking a look at. The goal is to implement this book class that we can see on the left of the screen right now. The exact details of the problem are implement the book class shown to the left and create a program that creates a few book objects and calls their methods. Define the book class in book.py and create a second file named book-test.py to test it. So the book class shown to the left has quite a number of attributes as well as methods that we're going to have to define and then we're going to want to test it out. So if you'd like, you could pause the video, try doing this problem yourself, and then unpause to compare the solutions, or you can follow along with me. If you're following along, remember that you can pause at any time in case I start getting too far ahead. Okay, let's switch over to PyCharm and try this out. Here we are in PyCharm, and I also have an image of that book class opened up in paint here, just so we can refer to it if we need to. So we're going to start in book.py, and we're going to define this class. And then after we've got it working, we can test it out in book test.py. Both of these are blank right now. So the first thing we're going to need to do if we're making a class is to use the class word to define that class. In this case, the name of the class is just book. Now we have a whole bunch of attributes to deal with here. All of these are attributes, and we're going to have to set them all up. And the best way to do that is usually in an int method. So we're going to define the int method. Remember, it's two underscores. And it takes a list of different parameters. We're going to take in from the other programmer who's implementing our class to set up some of these um, attributes. So we're probably going to want to import most of these as parameters. So we got title, author, pages, ISBN, genre, retail price, description, that's the blurb on the back of the book, and we have current page. So for current page, that's going to keep a track of where we currently are in the book. And I think we'll give that a default value of one, because usually when you start reading a book, you start on the first page. Now, some of the other attributes here, like bookmarks and is open are sort of more internal to this class. So we won't be allowing the implementer of this to specify these. We're going to define those internally. OK, so we got a list of different parameters we're going to take into this constructor int method. So title, author, pages, ISBN, genre, retail price, description, and current pages. And current pages is going to have a default value of 1. So now in this um, int method, we're going to have to start defining these attributes and then assigning them. Title, author, and I'm going to leave most of these as unprotected, sort of public, by not putting the underscore. If we wanted to be more protective of them and only allow access through like getters and setters, then we'd probably want to put the underscore in front. We'll put the underscore on a few ones that are more internal to this class, mostly. Right now, basically, we're just taking all the parameters that were given and storing them as instance attributes. Oh, we should probably correct the spelling of that. Description. And now we have current page.
Then what else? Well, actually, we want to make current page more protected. This isn't something we want people to be setting directly. This should be something that's set through some of these methods, like read page or open to page. So we're going to put the underscore here to let other people know that are using this class that they shouldn't be accessing this directly. It's an internal part. So we'll separate this. And we can have a list of our public ones and a list of our private ones. So the other two attributes that we need are bookmarks. That's going to be a collection of different bookmarks we have in this book. And we're just going to start that off as an empty list. And the other one that's more internal is is open, which represents if this book is open or not. We're going to start that off with false. OK, so we've got all of our attributes set up. And we have a sort of constructor int method that's going to set all their values for us. Current page is going to be set by default to one if it's not specified. And the other one's bookmark is always going to be set to an empty list. And is open is always going to be set to false to start with. So now we need to start defining these other methods. And in this case, we're going to have to be a little bit creative for what these actually do because we didn't have too many details. So the first one is going to be the open method. This doesn't take any parameters, but we always need to give self, even if it doesn't take any parameters, so it can refer to the current um, instance. And maybe we should check if the book is already opened, because if it's already opened, doing open on it again doesn't make too much sense. So if not self dot is open. So we're saying if the book isn't already open, and we're storing that in our is open attribute. Then we can open the book. So we'll set is open to true. And we'll also print out a message just letting them know that we opened it. If this was something more advanced, like maybe an e-reader, then maybe we would actually be doing something like opening to a page, processing something. But since this is just a fun example, we'll just be printing out that we opened the book. We'll say that the book. It's now open to page. We'll give them the current page. OK, so that should create a string called the book, and then gives the title. It's now open to the page, and then gives the current page, and then prints that out. Now, the other case we have to think about is what if this book is already open? So we could do things here like raise an exception. But in this case, I don't know if we really want to have an exception if the book's already open. Instead, maybe we'll just print out a message saying that it's already open. OK, save the book. I'll give them the book title again. They could have multiple instances of a class. We want to make sure that they know which book we're talking about. OK, so that looks good for our open method. If it's already open, we're going to give them that little message that the book's already open. If it's not already open, then we are going to open it by setting is open to true. And then we'll tell them where they are in the book. So the other method that kind of goes with that is close. So again, close doesn't take any parameters. But again, we should have a check to see if the book is already closed. And we know that that is recorded in is open. So in this case, we're checking it's open to true. If it is true, the book's open. That means we can close it. So we'll close the book. And then we'll print out to let them know that we closed the book. And we'll do an F string again. And we'll say book, give them the name of the book. There we go. Fortunately, this keyboard is not the best that we have in the studio. But we're making do. OK, so it says the book, then whatever the book's name is, it's now closed. And in the other case, we'll let them know that the book is already closed.
Okay, so that handles our open and close methods. So now that we have both open and closed done, what we should do is we should start testing. Even though we haven't finished the whole class, we should test as we go. So over here in book test, we're going to import the class. Or we should start with run. Book, which is the name of the module, import book. So it looks like they're named the same, but keep in mind there is a slight difference here. Book in the lowercase b refers to the module, this file, whereas book with an uppercase b refers specifically to this class. So we're saying from book, import the class book with a capital B. And we're just going to make a basic instance of this. So let's test book. And we can see that there's a whole bunch of different attributes that we can give it. And we could type these out in a row. For example, we could call this, make up a book called the art of Python. And we could continue giving it a list of different attributes like that, which would work fine, but it's a bit messy and confusing, especially when it's a really long list like this. So one thing we can do to make this a little cleaner and nicer to read is use named attributes. So by putting the name in front, it makes the code a little bit easier to read by showing exactly what this is going to be. So we're saying we're doing the title. Then I believe the next one was the author. This is just a made up book, so let's call him John Doe. And we'll say that it has how many pages? One, two, three. And I believe the next parameter was ISBN. That's just going to be a string. Let's try to put something that sort of looks like an ISBN. All right, that sort of looks like an ISBN. And then the next one is going to be the genre. Programming. And what's another good value for this? Let's say retail price. Oh, that should actually be a floating point value. And we can also put in the description. Say comprehensive guide to Python programming. Okay, and I'll just do like that to make it nice. So again, this isn't anything special. We could do this with functions as well. We're just using named arguments here to make it clear what each one is. And this would also allow us to provide them in another order. We could just as well just list the values in a big long list that was in the same order as this, but then it might be a little bit more confusing. Trying to figure out what like the one, two, three is without seeing pages equal makes the code less readable. So when you have a method or a function or a class like this that takes a long list of parameters, it can be good to line them out like this just to make the code as readable as possible. So hopefully we've created our book here. And then there's two things we can try. We can try opening the book, we can try closing the book. Open. Now let's try opening it again. It should give us that sort of error message. It's not an actual exception. And we'll try closing the book. And we'll try closing the book again. So if everything is working to plan, what should happen is we should open the book, get the message about the book being open. We should try opening it again and get an error saying that it's already open. We then close the book. And then we close the book again, which should give us an error about it being already open. So let's run and see what happens. So it looks like it's working correctly. We opened it to page one. It's already open. It's now closed and it's already closed. So that's just how we can go as we're working on it, testing as we go. So that seems to be working now. We're importing the book, the book class that is, we're making an instance of the book called test book for the art of Python, and we are opening it and closing it. So now our next task is going to be defining the rest of these methods. And the next one up it looks like is going to be bookmark page. And basically we are storing all the pages in a list of all the different bookmarks that have been created. So this method is going to have to add to that list. And it's going to take both the self keyword as well as a page number. The page number is going to be the page that we're trying to bookmark. 
but we should probably do a little bit of validation here. The page number might be coming in as something that's completely nonsensical, like the word duck instead of a number, or it could be something like a floating point number, which doesn't really make sense as a page number. The other issue we could have is the page number could be valid, as in it's an integer, but it could be a nonsensical value, like negative one. So we want to do a little bit of validation on the page number. But this is a task that we might have to do in other methods as well. So we might want to add a method, even though it's not shown on the side here, that solely just deals with validating page numbers. And this is going to be internal to this class because it's not going to be needed outside of it. So we're going to call it with an underscore validate and page. And it is going to take a page number. So by putting the underscore here, it tells other programmers that they shouldn't be using this outside of the class. When they make an instance of book, they shouldn't be calling this method. It's only for use inside of the class. Again, Python doesn't enforce that, but at least we are telling them what we expect. Okay, so this is going to have to do two different checks. The first one, is this actually an integer? And we can use the type function to get the type. And we're going to say, is not an integer. So if it's not an integer, then we'll probably raise an exception here. That's not really something we can recover from. We're going to use the type error exception because it is a type error. And what we're going to do is we're going to say invalid page number type must be int. Now, the other condition that could happen is if it's a valid integer, but it is an invalid value, like negative one. Let's say not. So in this case, we have the number of pages that are valid, the total number of pages in the book as a parameter, and we store that in the attribute pages. So what we're doing down here is we're checking, is page number less than and equal to one? And is it less than or equal to the total number of pages in the book? We have this surrounded in not, so that means it's going to flip it. So that means if this is true here, this part, that means it's a valid page number. It's in the correct range. So if this is true, then we are going to say not, which means it's false. So this won't run. So this is only going to run if it's an invalid page number. And there's other ways we could write this line. We could flip the ranges around and do it that way as well. But this one works fine. In this case, we're going to raise a value error. We're going to say valid page number. And what should the error be? All right, we'll say the title. Oh, this keyboard. So we're going to say that the title has the specific number of pages it has to give the user a hint at what went wrong here. And we have to make sure that this has an F to make it an F string. So the title has this number of pages. Okay. And what else do we need to do? So this should be the only two checks we need to do in validate page. In either case, if either of these are true, it's going to raise an exception. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. It'll just return none. So we can start this method off, the bookmark page, by checking if it is a valid page number. So what's going to happen is it's going to call the validate page method. It's going to send it page number. If one of these exceptions is triggered, it's going to propagate back to this method. And since we're not handling the exception at all and try accept, it's going to propagate then out of this function as well. And then whoever called this will get the exception, and then they'll be able to deal with it better. The reason why we want to propagate rather than handling it ourselves is there's no way we can really correct this error. If we get like the word cat instead of a page number, there's no way we could actually interpret it cat as a valid page. Same thing if we got like a page number of minus 10, there's not much we could do to fix that. So instead of trying to figure it out or interpret what the person calling it could have meant, we'll just send them back the exception. 
Okay, so after this line, if we got to this point and no exception caused this to terminate, that means which should be valid page number, and we can start actually adding that to our bookmarks. So let's add that to our list of bookmarks. And we stored that in bookmarks, and we can simply use append to add the page number. So right now, this takes page number, validates that it's valid, and if it is, it's going to add it to our list of bookmarks. Now we can make this funk method even more useful, because maybe we want to bookmark the current page we're on, and we don't want to have to figure out what that is. So what we could do is make page number have a default. In this case, I'm going to make the default none. So that means if they don't give a page number, it's going to be equal to the none object, which just to serve like a placeholder if it doesn't yet have a value. Then we're going to check if page num is none, then we're going to change the value of page num to our current page. So what this is going to do is when they call this bookmark page method, if they don't give us a page argument at all, it's just going to set it to the current page. Otherwise, we'll use the page number they provided. So this makes this method a little bit more useful because it can do two different things. It can bookmark the current page or it could bookmark any page. So what I'm going to do next is jump ahead a little bit to this get bookmarks method. The reason why we're going to do that is if I finish this get bookmarks method, we can test this a little bit sooner than if I implemented everything else first. So we'll start with that. And the order that you define these methods in a class isn't going to matter for when we're using that instance of the object. So you can define these usually in pretty much any order, unless you're doing something special. So we're going to do get bookmarks. This isn't going to take any um, arguments. We just have the self parameter. But it is going to return the list of bookmarks. Now we could simply do return bookmarks like this. So we're going to return the list. But the issue with setting it up like this is this doesn't return a copy of the list of bookmarks. It copies the reference. So that means if they were to change the list of bookmarks outside of our class, it would also change the list inside of our class of bookmarks. And we probably don't want that because they're probably not going to consider what this will do to the class or that it could be linked. So instead of returning a reference to our mutable list of bookmarks that they could edit on us, we're going to return a copy of it. And one of the ways we could do that is with the list function. So this is going to pass it the bookmark list. It's going to create a copy of the list and return that. So we create a copy of bookmarks and we send that back rather than letting them access our bookmark list and make any changes they want. This way, any changes they make to the list that we return won't impact our class. Let's test that out now. So we're back in our book test. And we'll continue on with this book here. Okay, test book. And we'll get rid of these open clothes. They aren't really helpful right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to first bookmark a page. We'll say page, I think it goes up to 123. So let's try bookmarking page 45. And we'll also try bookmarking page. 123. When you're testing, it's usually good to test at the edges or the bounds of valid input. 45, 1, 2, 3, 1. This tests both of those bounds. And we can also test it to bookmark the current page we're on, which would be page 1. And do what other should we test? Well, we should test the get bookmarks method and see what happens after this. So this should add a bookmark at page 45, 123, 1, and then a second bookmark at page 1, and then we should return that using get bookmarks and print out the list. Let's see what happens. And we do get our list here, and it looks like it has the valid bookmarks. So we do, the way we've implemented this right now, allow users to bookmark the same page over and over again, which can be fine. It depends how you interpret the specification here. If we didn't want to have the same bookmark bookmarked multiple times, then we might want to use a set instead of a list. A set would ensure that there's no duplicates. So we should also test our error cases. So let's try some ones that shouldn't be valid. Negative one, we'll start off with that, and it should give us an error. Yep, the Art of Python has 123 pages, so negative one wouldn't be a valid page. 
Let's try 124. Yep, we get the same error because that's outside the bounds the other way. When you're testing errors, it's good to test one outside of each bound. And let's test something really silly, like a duck. Is a duck a valid page? No, it must be an int. Okay, so those methods seem to be working now, so we can keep on working on our class. Now we're getting to making some good progress. What do we need to do next? Next, we're going to read pages. Define read pages. And that's going to take a number of pages to read. So what this method should do is a few things. First of all, it should inform the user that they did the reading. Then it should also advance our current page to however many pages. But there is a special case, and that is if we read to the end of the book, then we should stop at the last page. So let's start adding in that now. So the first thing we're going to need to know is if the book is open. If the book's not open, we can't really read pages. So we'll start with an if statement. And we're going to check if it's open. So if it's not open, then we are going to raise an exception. I'm going to use value error here because there isn't really a better built in type. And we haven't learned how to make our own exception. I'll make this f string. So I need to open. We'll just name it book again. For reading. Okay, so if the book isn't open, they get an exception that you need to open whatever the book name is before reading. And now we can handle reading the book. So we have to know what page we're going to end up on after we read that many pages. So that would be the current page plus num pages. And what we're going to want to know is the new page past the end of the book. So if new page is greater than self dot pages, that means that we finished the book. So we probably want to tell the user that and update our current page to the last page in the book and not go outside of the bounds. So let's start by telling them they've made it to the end of the book. F string. Finished the book. And we'll put the book title again. Ooh, that key always causes me trouble on this keyboard. Okay. So this should print out to the user, you finished the book and then the name of the book. And then we want to update the current page to the last page in the book. We don't want to go over the last page. We assume that even if they put in a number of pages that's longer than the end of the book, that they're going to stop when they reach the end of the book. They're not going to like have new pages magically spawn into existence that they read. And since we're at the end of the book, I guess we can also close the book. So by setting is open to false, we say that the book is now closed. Now the other case we have to handle is that we now have made it, or we haven't made it to the end of the book. We read some pages, but it wasn't enough to get to the end. So in this case, we're going to update the current page to the new page, because we know that it hasn't gone past the end bounds. And then we can print out to the user to let them know what page they're now on. Oh, that's just num pages. Okay. So you've read num pages and you're now on page. And since we updated current page, we can use that right here. Okay. So I think this method is about done. Let's see. We are checking if it book is open. If it's not, we're raising an exception. We're calculating the new page we're on. If it's past the end of the book, then we say we finished the book and we close the book. And we set current page equal to the last page in the book. 
Otherwise, if we haven't quite made it to the end of the book, we update current page to where we'd be and let the user know. So one other thing we could do is instead of just saying is open equals false, we could also instead call the close method. And that's because we are allowed to call other methods from within a method, and that would cause the book to be checked if it's closed, and it would say the book is now closed. Now doing it this way, calling the method can have a few advantages. First of all, we're going to get that output to let the user know that the book is closed. And maybe later on when we're working on a new version of this class, we might want to do some extra tasks when the book is open and closed. Maybe we want to have a log file that we write to or something like that. If we always handle closing or opening the book through these methods, even when that's internal, that action, that means that we can have a central place where that state is always changed. So if we want to change how that book is closed later on, this would give us an advantage in that it would allow us to modify it here, and we won't have to modify all these other methods. So when we can take advantage of the methods we've already created, we should do that because it makes things more maintainable, easier to debug, and less code to write, which is always great. So we've made read pages, but to test this, we're going to have to be able to get the current page. So the next thing we should try implementing is get current page. Okay. So we're going to make a new method called get current page. And this isn't going to take anything, it's just going to return something. So this method is going to be very simple. It's just a simple getter that's going to return the value of current page. You might be wondering why we're not making a copy of it like we did with bookmarks. While lists in Python are mutable, meaning that the person calling this could actually modify the bookmarks list and then modify it in our class. However, integers like current page are immutable, meaning that it's not going to modify our class or change the value at all if they change this outside of the class. So we don't have to worry about making a copy. But we do have to worry about testing this to make sure our read pages method is working. So here we are back to book test. We have our test book here. And let's try reading to a page. And let's say we read. 100 pages. So that should get us to page 101. And then we're going to print out our current page. And get current page. Okay, so if this works, we should get a message about reading 100 pages. That shouldn't put us past the end. It should just take us to page 101. And then we should get the value 101 printed out that we got using get current page. Let's see. Oh, that's interesting. We have an exception. So what happened here? And it says you need to open the Art of Python before reading, which is correct. Remember in our code, we said that we only want to be able to read the book if it's already open. And we also said that books start in a closed state. And we did not open the book. So it's working correctly, even though our test wasn't correct. So what we should do before we do this is actually open the book. There we go. So now it should open the book, then read to the right page, and then we should output 101. And it seems to be working correctly. We open the book, that's this message, we read 100 pages and get to page 101, and then we get the return from this print line here, which is that the current page is 101. That looks okay. We already accidentally tested that first error case, but there was another case that we need to test, and that is reading past the end of the book. So let's add another line here and do some more reading. This time we'll read 50 pages. And this should take us past the end of the book because this book only has 123 pages. So what should happen is it should let us know we've reached the end of the book, and the current page shouldn't be added another 52. Instead, it will just be equal to the last page of the book, which should be 123. Let's see. So you can see that we now have the second line saying that we finished the book. The book is now closed. We get this because if you remember, we call the close method, and the close method handles outputting that message when the book is closed. Then we get the value of 123 when we call get current page, and that's because we've reached the end of the book, which only has 123 pages. 
So everything seems to be working correctly so far, which is great. Now we can move on to implementing the other methods that we haven't yet. And I think we've basically through all the hard ones. What do we have left? We have print details and get book state. So I'm going to start with get book state because that's an easy one. And by book state here, we mean that if the book is opened or closed. So again, this is going to be a simple return is open. And again, since this is immutable, we don't need to make a copy of it. There's nothing they can do to it that's going to affect the class. And the last one to implement is going to be print details. And what print details should do is it should just output the details that we have stored in this book in a nice format. So we've got all these different attributes we have about the book, so we should print them all out for the user. And we'll start by printing out the title. Then we'll print, to make it look nice formatting, we'll put sort of a line after the title. We'll use string repetition. So we're going to say we're printing out 20 dashes. And then we'll start printing out the different attributes of the book. I'm going to fast forward this a bit because it's just going to be me typing. And we're back. So what did I do here? Well, basically, we just added a bunch of print lines that print out all the different attributes. One that we had to handle specially was the retail price, because I want to make sure that's always rounded to two decimal places. And I also want to put that dollar sign in front of it. So we used an F string instead of just putting different arguments to print. We also have the page they left off on, and it's fine to access the attributes like this because we're inside of the class still. Then here, I'm going to print out a list of all their different bookmarks. And we're just looping through each page in the bookmarks list and printing that out. So why don't we give that a test? So let's try test book. Print details. And I believe we also got the state of the book or made that method. So we say, say book is open and then we'll output either true or false using the get book state. Okay, let's see if this works. That bit bigger. So we're getting all that stuff from the previous test. And now here is the output from our little program that prints all of the attributes. So we're getting the author, ISBN, pages, price, where we left off on. And we don't get anything for bookmarks because we didn't actually add any bookmarks. So we'll have to test that out. Book is open equals false. So that seems to be working. Let's try a few things to make this more interesting. We'll make it open. And let's bookmark some things. Page 10. Mark page 42, and we'll bookmark the current page, which should be the last page in the book at that point. And we'll see if that adds to our list. So now we are getting a list of different bookmarks, 10, 42, and the current page, which is 123. And we can see our book is now open, which is true. And looking at this, there is one method I don't think we've implemented yet. And that is our open to page method. And this basically changes the current page to the page given, and it also makes sure that the book is open. So let's add that now. I believe that was open to page, and it takes a page number. And again, we are going to want to make sure that this page number is valid. But luckily, we've already written the code for that, so we can reuse it. And that code was this validate method. So we can simply call that again. So that's going to call validate page up here. 
It's going to check if it's valid. If it's not, it's going to raise an exception. That exception would propagate here. And since we're not handling it, that exception would again propagate outward to the caller, which is what we want in this case, because we can't really handle it because we don't have enough context. Okay, so what do we want to do here? Well, if the book is open, we're going to want to then turn to that page. If, and if the book's not open, we're going to want to still turn to that page, but we're going to want to make sure the book is set to open. So we validated that the page number is valid. So that means we can now trust that we could set the current page to that. And now we want the book to be open. So since this method is called open to page, we're gonna assume that it works even if the book's closed. If the book's closed, we assume that means you open the book and then turn to a specific page. So what we can do is we can simply just set is open equals true. We don't need to test the current value of is open because it doesn't really matter if it's closed or if it's open, we want it to be open. So we can just say is open equals true. We don't need an if statement in this case. And then we should let the user know what happened. And we'll use page number. Now we should test if that's working. Okay, so we've got a lot going on here, so we'll get rid of some of this just to keep it simpler. And what we'll do is, let's see, we'll print out the details to start with. And actually, we'll bring that back. We'll also print out the current book state. Then we will try opening to a page. We'll try, how many we have? 123. Let's go open to page 99. And then we'll print the details out again. So we should get the print details. It should print all this out, as well as the current page, which would be one, because we haven't done anything yet. We'll then print out, is the book open? Which should be false, because we haven't opened the book yet. We're now going to call open to page. We're going to give it page 99. So that should open the book and turn us to page 99. And then when we print it out again, we should see that we're on page 99 and that the book is now open. Let's see. Okay, so this is the first output. And we can see that all of this is printed correctly. We're on page one. We don't have any bookmarks because we haven't called bookmark. And we can see the book is not opened. Then we called the open page or open to page. That is going to say that we opened the art of Python to page 99. And then we output the details. We get the details. We can see that we're now on page 99 and that the book is now open. That's true. So there is one more thing to mention, and that is in our open to page method, I set is open equals to true. So why did I do this rather than calling the open method? The reason why in this case is if the book was already opened, it would print out the book is already open, which isn't what we want. In this case, we want the method to open the book to a specific page, regardless of the book's open or not. You could think of that as you have the book already open, you're reading it, you go, oh, maybe I want to change to page 99, so I flip it to it. If we called the open method, we'd get that weird message about the book already being open. So in this case, we can't simply call the open method because it doesn't do the exact same thing. So there are some improvements we could make. We could change how the open method works to accommodate all that, make our code a little nicer, a little bit more elegant. Another thing we, we could do is add a little bit more error checking. We have some good error checking on page num and bookmark page and open to page, but there are some other places where we take input, for example, read pages, where we could get something we don't expect. For example, num pages could be something nonsensical, like a floating point value, or some text, like the word duck. And that wouldn't make any sense and it wouldn't work because we wouldn't be catching it in this exception. So there are areas for improvement. If you want, you can try some of those at home. The other thing you can try at home is improving this test. So we kind of test it as we go, but maybe you want to write out a long thing that's going to test all the methods. Make sure you test all the different paths through it. We'll see another example in the slides in one sec. Let's switch back there now. And we're back to the slide. And in the slides, and both on our learning management system, I have a copy of that solution. But this one also has some added comments to make everything more clear. That's going to be called book.py 
on our learning management system. If you're watching this video on there, you should be able to find a box down here called video resources. That will take you right there. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll have to go to our learning management system to find those files, or you could try copying it from the slides. So in the slides, we'll have that solution here. And we'll also have a program to test it with. This is similar to what I made during that little demo, but it has a little bit more detail and it makes sure it tests all the methods. So I would try that out at home and you can find that on our learning management system as well. And lastly, in the slides, I have an example of what the output should be for that test program. That's all I have for you in this video. Thank you for making it to the end and watching that whole demo. Hopefully you've tried it out at home because there's a lot to learn from giving it a try yourself. Thank you for watching and have a great day.